The theme of this year's conference is Resilience and Re-Innovation. This year we have five speakers up. We have international speakers as well as local. Let's kick off with our first speaker. Didier Farge is the CEO of, and President of Connections Paris. He'll be speaking on trends in data marketing for 2021. We've had the privilege of meeting Didier in Paris as well as in the USA. And he is very knowledgeable in client acquisitions and customer retention. So we look forward to um, an interesting talk. The next speaker in the lineup is Candace Goodman. Candace needs no introduction. She's a South African that has proved herself over and over again. She's won um, the largest award in Guys, and that is the award of the Direct Marketer of the Year in 2016. So we look forward to those insights. She'll be speaking on mobile marketing and insights. Our next speaker is Stefan Oberholzer. Stefan is the CEO of Wevend Online. They're a creative group that um, performs online training in digital, but they are linked very closely to the legal aspects of online. Stefan will be speaking about the DPCP, the Data Protection Compliance Program, and it's an exciting program that we've launched at the DMA. We've piloted it, and it is ready to launch this year. Keep your ears to the ground. He'll be sharing insights with you. Nicole Glover is our next speaker. She's the Young Asagai Awards winner, and she'll be speaking on tips of how to be a winner. Nicole describes herself as a social and digital marketer, and we look forward to hearing all the tidbits on how she puts together strategy and a winning formula. And our final speaker, Kino Johnson, the executive head of Digital and Direct Channel at Old Mutual, will be sharing with us re-innovation and finding new ways. Kino had to find new ways of getting 470 staff to remain productive during COVID as they work from home. This is going to be a very interesting discussion and stay tuned to learn the insights of how Kino got strategic while keeping business going. I look forward to hearing about this as we can all learn from the challenges of 2020. We look forward to a jam-packed innovative conference. Hi, I'm Yasmina Dorshi, Business Manager at Connexence with Norman Thompson. Uh, today we are going to discuss with Didier Farge, who is a data enthusiast and also expert. Uh, you have written some key trends for next year in data marketing. Uh, Didier, you are a member of the DMA family and also member of the board at FEDMA and also CEO at Connexence with Norman Thompson France. Hi, South African DMA. COVID-19 has changed the way the world interacts and communicates. Few industries have experienced more change in early 2020 than ever. The direct and integrated marketing sector must find new ways of reaching customers. World's marketeers must completely transform their strategy to communicate with audiences that are different, but they also need to transform and re-evaluate the way we share knowledge between us. Now more than ever, the global DMA family needs to connect. And it is with this in mind that I send my warmest greetings to our South African DMA colleagues. I'm very happy to be with you today. As part of the DMA, we share values. We share the love for data in this challenging period. But this is also a special moment for us. There is new opportunities and transformation possibilities. I'm proud to be with you today. Didier, you have recently written um, some trends for the data marketing business for 2021. Beyond the health and different difficulties we've all been experiencing in the past years uh, between lockdown and curfews, um, this has had a major impact in the data marketing industry at all levels. Some consumers have changed from their uh, buying behaviour to e-commerce. What would you have to say about that? That's right, e-commerce has grown by 24%. Customers have been forced to shop online. E-commerce proved to be a resilient industry. This has created a massive flow of requests and customer information, which has led companies to adapt and finally to put the customer, who has become omnichannel in essence, 
at the heart of their marketing, which has become digital. Some marketers even say that we saved four years of innovation and digitalization. In terms of data, what is the first trend you see? First, I would say the data business is moving towards CRM and conversational marketing. At the expense of prospection marketing, based on volume research and acquisition, data providers will see the trend towards a better knowledge of their own customers. They also will see the implementation on conversation strategies, requiring a good knowledge of their own file, but a good knowledge of the customer preferences and permission, as well as their different level of consent. And to master customer relationship, which technique evolves the fastest? I would take marketing automation as the one who is really reinventing itself. According to Salesforce, 67% of marketing managers already rely on marketing automation. 21% will work on it the year to come. So the new trend is for marketing automation to access to connected platform and to activate the scenarios to different channels, including media. What about brands in all this? Their commitment, their brand identity and values are keys to differentiate themselves in this market. What do you think about that? Brand identity and values are major priorities for marketers in 21. 57% of people consider that brand priority must be a positive contribution on society. So brands need to be inspiring and need to be inspiring to grow. Their values and above all the proof of these promises are a necessity for consumers. According to the study carried out by Wenham and Thompson end of 19, inspiring brands are those who generate growth and value. And important to highlight, the study highlights the correlation between inspiration and growth and gives an inspiration score on a hundred or so brands. Cookies are disappearing in 2022 and the data landscape is changing. What is your reading of the new ways to connect? The use of data becomes martech and technology driven. Welcome to the platforms. With the disappearance of third party cookies, data first party and second party has become the keystone for companies looking to reinvent data driven marketing. They will reinvent this marketing with unified data in a single connected platform. They will be able to receive information, insight, transactions, and will be connected to third-party database to support their customers throughout their journey. So connected tools which can identify customers and match them with digital an activable point will be the key in 21. In 21, we're going to see graphs based platforms initiatives that will be launched this year. 21 will see a lot of other innovation in this area. In the communication channel, we've seen that the direct mail remains uh, strong and maintain its position, but uh, there's a few changes that we've all noticed, and you've mentioned one specifically, which is email. Would you say that email is changing its purpose? Email continues its qualitative development and changes its vocation. If emailing is more qualitative, with stable volumes, but better performance, we used to say mail less, but mail best. Email address, email marketing, has become the main key to the chain, allowing to connect offline and online data without using cookies. In 21, email address has in fact a new mission. It will become a major component of platforms and it will help to reconciliate identifiers, IDs, and connect them to the digital space. And on the brand side, would you say that inclusion and diversity are buzzwords? On the opposite. Inclusion and diversity are a necessity. 29% of consumers are ready to change brands 
if they do not represent diversity. So inclusion is not a buzzword, but a fundamental trend and a need for brand commitment. We've been hearing about one-to-one -one marketing and targeting individuals for a long time. Would you say that this is still a trend? Hyper-personalization is no longer a target. In 2021, thanks to the need to connect often online data while respecting the rights and preferences of customers, marketeers will adopt more mass personalization. This approach that allows offers to be adapted to behavior without targeting individuals. So we're going to see more one to few or one to segment marketing arriving. Um, does regulation come second after the health crisis? A study shows that 35% are still not completely uh, at ease with the reg regulation and contract with their service providers. What would be the trend for 2021? GDPR and regulation on local basis are still a major concern. In France, 30% of companies are not GDPR compliant yet. And among them, there is still a lot to be done by DPOs and associations. In 2021, we will see the emergence of new certification labels, new code of conduct developed by local and also by international associations. We haven't talked about social media. What will it be in 2021? Social marketing is still developing. Think about TikTok success. 800 million users above the main network as LinkedIn, Twitter, Pinterest or Snapchat. If we keep in mind that social networks account for one out of three purchases on mobile phones, of course, mixing channels with social is absolutely and always a winning recipe. What would you say about the trend and evolution of privacy in 2021? Do you think pedagogy will pay off? Trust and education in data matters. The more trust there is, the more comfortable consumers are with the idea on online behavioral advertising or sharing their data. Indeed, trust and understanding of the use made of their data can increase from 38% to 59% the number of internet users who prefer to receive advertising adjusted or targeted to their interests. And finally, Didier, what do you think would be the keyword for 2021? Back to CRM and conversational marketing, inspiration, unique connected customer platforms as ID graph, inclusion, and trust and pedagogy. Hi, I'm Candice Goodman. I was the DMA's Direct Market of the Year 2016 and currently a non-executive board member of the Direct Marketing Association. I founded a mobile marketing technology enablement company called Mobitainment 15 years ago, and we help companies translate technology into business solutions and marketing results. And I hope to share a few insights with you today as to why South Africa has turned from a mobile first country to a mobile forced country. South Africa has always been a mobile first country. But since lockdown, it has become mobile forced. So let's learn how to use this force. That is the right mobile tech tools to overcome the challenges, leverage the trends and take advantage of the opportunities. I will unpack what the stats are telling us and showcase local solutions that have become award-winning campaigns. Nearly 95% of South Africans are accessing the internet from their mobile phones and most with a smartphone. 98.5% of South Africans are experiencing social media on their mobile phone. So what are the biggest challenges? I believe the biggest challenge we have seen for mobile marketing 
is the cost and availability of data, especially during these times. For a while now, data could cost financially constrained South Africans a hundred times more when purchased in small bundles, and during lockdown, this issue has only escalated. And adding to the limited access to Wi-Fi at schools and at work, and limited access to be able to top up, has led many South Africans not having airtime or data exactly when marketers want to communicate with them and want them to respond. So, to overcome these challenges, let your brand sponsor the customer's engagement by reverse billing the costs. But how do we do that? Ever heard of the data-free movement? Check this out. No airtime, no Wi-Fi, no data, no problem. When you see this, it's not costing you. That's right, no data charges, 100% data mahala. That's right, we use cloud-based technology that allows us to create a mirror image of your site on a reverse build IP address domain range and we pull the content from your site to that page. You can then provide your customers with that data-free link rather than your original one, and it won't cost them one meg of data. It works for apps, mobile websites, and campaign sites. With millions of South Africans not on smartphones, USSD is still a must. Yes, those star 120 star dial codes are still very popular. In fact, we just ran a campaign for a mobile survey on reverse build web and USSD and 78% preferred dialing the USSD code. And as we prepare for Papier's 1st of July deadline, providing a free to consumer USSD channel is a quick and convenient way to collect, refresh and augment your customer profiles and consent for communication. Nowadays, you should even reverse build your SMS replies. Why? Because the Papier Act Section 69 covering direct marketing says that you have to offer an easy way to opt out on each communication. That is free of charge. So you can offer a reverse build SMS reply, SMS shortcode or USSD code to dial in to allow them to opt out. And why not even sponsor their next call to a loved one? in exchange for listening to an ad. Nivea provided 150,000 unique people with the ability to speak to a loved one, building a permission-based database of over 158,000 people in just six days. What trends are we seeing and how can we take advantage of them? 97% of South African internet users are using chat apps, with 93% having used WhatsApp in the last month. However, you need to know how to leverage this channel with respect to your customer. Because customers are expecting your brand to be there so they can request info, start a conversation and get support. Facebook, the owners of WhatsApp, have set some strict rules around how you are allowed to communicate with your customers using WhatsApp. You need to get their consent and communicate back to them within a 24-hour window period from when they messaged you unless you are sending them a non-marketing, highly structured message that WhatsApp needs to approve before you can send it to your base. So the solution is to use a chatbot. A chatbot can help you respond within that 24-hour period and guide the conversation with the customer. It allows your customer to send and receive images, videos and documents, and even break out to an agent if they need help. It can be used to provide a library of PDF documents, for customer profiling and surveys, for competition entry mechanics, even to upload a till slip, and to get your pin location to provide them with your customer with the nearest store. Riches created this WhatsApp chatbot for their junior chefs to access their snackable, on-demand content at a low cost. 396 products and recipes to share during lockdown. Take a look at this. I hope you're not hungry.
During lockdown, the recruitment of young artists for the Business and Arts South Africa debut youth program seemed an impossible task until they leveraged a WhatsApp chatbot, resulting in increased inclusivity and accessibility and 207% more quality applicants in 25% of the time. Or even reward Bob Martin customers for purchasing and allowing us to verify their purchase with their till slip on WhatsApp. Why not try it for yourself? Scan the QR code or SMS your name to 32117 or WhatsApp us on this number and just say hi to experience it for yourself. What other trends are you seeing that we could leverage? 98% of South African internet users were watching videos online before lockdown and this increased even more since then. But the opportunity for marketers is in making the video engaging and relevant to the viewer. How do we do that? The trick is to combine video and data to create a personalized and interactive video experience. A personalized video can include the viewer's name embedded into the image of the video as well as spoken in the audio together with personal information like policy details and amounts unique to them. An interactive video allows the viewer to click on a hotspot button in the video or enter their personal information, which can then determine the course of the next scene of the video. This becomes extremely powerful for lead generation as you educate your prospect, pre-qualify their interest and gather their contact details as well as permission to contact them all within the video. Take a look at this. and welcome to Somerset Village, a new development in Midland that offers three standing units, 70, 76 and 92 square. Which one would you be interested in? Great choice. Our financing options include the installment sales agreement and the rent to own. Which one best suits you? Thank you for answering. We look forward to hearing from you. Please book an appointment. Somerset Village, your home awaits. Now that's what I call smart marketing. This series of interactive videos was used very successfully in educating South Africans around COVID-19 because it was zero rated, gamified, with in-video quiz voiced in four different languages to transcend communication barriers. So it's all about shared value. Give me something of value and I don't mind sharing information with you. This is a great way to refresh your customer database in preparation for Papia. Thanks you for being a valued customer. And as with previous generations, it is our privilege to provide families and individuals like yourself with our ever-growing range of quality products that you have grown to love. We would like to know more about you and would like to confirm the information we have on record or edit it where it is incorrect, missing or changed. On completion, earn your share of 25,000 Rand airtime. Thanks you for taking the time to refresh your info. So, in summary, the key takeaways are reverse bill to sponsor the costs of your Mobi sites, apps, USSD, and SMS replies. Leverage WhatsApp business using a chatbot to optimize the business because that's where your customers are. Combine video and data to create a personalized and interactive video experience that is engaging and collaborative. 
that's a wrap from me. I hope it's been insightful and we will enable you to use mobile technology to enhance your next campaign. Over and out. Hello everyone. My name is Stefan Wibberalser. I am the CEO of Weave and Online. Uh, we are an alternative legal services provider. Uh, I'm a lawyer by profession and essentially we comprise of a team of lawyers, accountants, software developers and just in general creatives. We are here today uh, enjoying this installment of the Insights Conference uh, 2021. I would like to express uh, our sincere thanks and gratitude to the Direct Marketing Association's team for inviting us. Thank you for making us a part of this journey alongside you. We do sincerely appreciate it. Um, we really do appreciate the partnership with the DMA as well. Uh, and we look forward to really providing continued value to, to its membership base uh, well into the future. So thank you very much uh, yet again, we do appreciate it. Today, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at South Africa's prevailing data protection law, the Protection of Personal Information Act. We're going to try and assist uh, the, the delegates or, or, or those of you who, who are taking part in this conference this year um, to break down this piece of legislation, um, to really simplify it. Uh, I'm going to make use of, of a um, you know, really basic uh, sort of metaphor and analogy to, to explain um, ultimately how we view, uh, you know, tackling this uh, monumental compliance effort which all businesses and, and responsible parties out there uh, are facing at the moment. Uh, so we're going to be dealing with that. We're going to be dealing with it in segments um, and ultimately we're going to be tying everything together to really give you a you know, introduction or a foretaste into what uh, the Direct Marketing Association uh, is going to be providing to its members in, 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 in due course, uh, as well as uh, the value offering which we as an alternative legal service provider um, bring to the market and assist our clients um, uh, with. So with that said, Let's hop straight in. The first aspect which I want to deal with, because I know and, and completely appreciate that Poppy, uh, let's refer to, to the act as Poppy for today's session. Poppy is really making a lot of you anxious and it is not necessary. We want to try and assist you in calming uh, you down, uh, really giving you practical tools and, 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 and guidance, advice, assistance, uh, in, in, in breaking down what it is you actually need to do and what it is you need to know about. Um, we completely also you know, appreciate that uh, this piece of legislation is, is, is a very difficult piece of legislation to interpret and to apply and implement. Uh, and we're going to be trying to use you know, simple language and, and, and straightforward um, you know, practical scenarios to, to, to illustrate uh, what our value offering is, what we are um, working with the DMA on and how we are going to be assisting you uh, in the long term and, and to really tackle this, this journey uh, effectively. Um, you know, we are in really difficult, challenging economic times uh, and, you know, from a compliance perspective, uh, we are also being challenged by um, evolving legislation such as Poppy and we need to deal with it effectively. We need to be smart and in keeping with the DMA's theme for this year's Insights Conference, we really want to impart upon you a resilient mindset, an attitude of resilience uh, and, and innovation. You know, um, you might ask me why that would be necessary. The reason is that, you know, this act, Poppy, is, is, is not going to be easy to implement. So you're going to have to be resilient, especially when it comes to, you know, fostering uh, awareness, uh, creating a culture of compliance internally within your organization. You are really going to have to engage with various stakeholders at various levels. And the act, uh, the objectives of the act really strike at so many levels that it requires such a, a, a deep 
uh, level of engagement with various stakeholders, business units within a particular organization, and it really is not easy. It is not going to be easy, and therefore you need to be resilient. You need to uh, bounce back quickly, establish whether something works. If it doesn't work, pivot, change, adopt a different approach, um, and we are going to really today deal with how you can do that to navigate this piece of legislation. So resilience being the one topic of this broader theme for this year's Insights Conference, the other one being re-innovation or innovation. And the reason why I believe that is relevant when it comes to implementing and applying Poppy uh, from a compliance perspective is that your business processes are constantly changing, right? Your business processes are, are, are developing on a daily basis and in order to align or to peg your compliance obligations to your business processes and make sure that you are, yes, you are complying, but you are also innovating, developing business processes that not only help you grow your business, but also ensure that you stay and remain compliant with this piece of legislation as well. So within that sort of theme um, framework, we're going to be dealing with Poppy, we're going to be dealing with what I believe to be a, a very uh, hot topic at the moment um, within the Poppy landscape, which is the registration and appointment of, of information officers uh, and what their responsibilities are within your organization. And we are also going to be dealing with essentially five steps that we believe you need to follow in order to establish and then equip yourself uh, with the necessary tools to effectively maintain your, your level of compliance or an appropriate level of compliance uh, in, in these circumstances. Compliance, it's very important to, to appreciate this right at the outset uh, with this piece of legislation and data protection legislation in general is not a definitive line. It's the, there is no one size fits all solution for any particular organization. So what we need to do is essentially give you the tools in order to apply those tools to your unique scenarios and then effectively comply with your obligations in terms of the act. All right, so before I get to the, the, the five key points and articulate to you what, what those are, I'd like to sketch a, 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 a picture and make use of, of an analogy and, and, and a few metaphors that we can use to, to um, essentially flesh out what, what I'm about to share with you. So the way that I believe one should consider or approach poppy compliance in general is if any of you are familiar with uh, American football, consider Poppy as an American football scenario, as a, as, as a team, an NFL team. So essentially what you have is you've got the team as a, as, as, as a broader uh, collective of individuals and, and various uh, team functions, uh, which is the metaphor for the responsible party your business, your company, your organization. Then you've got the various moving parts of that team, which is your offensive and your defensive line. And then of course, the role that most people will be familiar with is that of the quarterback, the playmaker, um, the one who ultimately, uh, whether he was wrong or not, takes responsibility for the success or failure of, 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 of the team as a whole. So. The team being the metaphor for the responsible party. Uh, now, when you embark on, 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 on a game, uh, essentially uh, the quarterback is the information officer or the metaphor for the information officer. And that person is going to be, or rather play a very pivotal, important role in establishing the set of plays that that team is going to execute throughout the course of that, of that game. Now, the quarterback, as the information officer in this context, may be the one who sets the plays and plays a very important part in formulating those plays, but ultimately the plays get executed by various parties and various role players within this, this team. 
He is the person who is responsible for setting the plays and making sure that the ball ends up in the right hands and ultimately ends up in the end zone for a touchdown, so to speak. So the metaphor or the, the ball is essentially in this context a metaphor for the various compliance tools that you as an organization are going to either commission or develop yourselves from time to time. If you use the ball as a metaphor for your privacy policy framework, for your um, technical policy framework, your information security policy frameworks, for your training and, and, and internal awareness program, ultimately um, you need to make sure as the information officer, the quarterback, that those tools end up in the right hands and get executed and implemented correctly. Now enter your defensive and offensive lines, right? So from a compliance perspective we tend to often think or uh, jump to the conclusion that the minute that we've got our policy framework in place and the minute that we've got our training executed and our information officer appointed job done and you are now effectively compliant, which is not true and that is a misconception which could land you in some proverbial hot water as far as the regulator is concerned. So now the quarterback has the ball, the play has been called, in other words the information officer has been appointed, uh, you have developed certain um, tools and implemented, started implementing certain tools internally to establish a, a culture and an environment of compliance. But now ultimately that ball needs to be passed and that ball needs to end up in the right hands. Um, and this is where the defensive and offensive lines come in. So your defensive line, typically a very reactive or a more reactive function within a football team, they defend the line and make sure that the opposing side doesn't end up in the end zone. Now if you could use the defensive line as a metaphor for your contractual documents, uh, certain policies that make sure that you set protocols and that there are obligations imposed upon parties who process information or personal information within your organization uh, and externally as well. A contract is, is, is a reactive way in many respects of regulating uh, a compliance effort because it's also not going to proactively safeguard your technical systems for instance. So enter the offensive line which ultimately is a metaphor for the proactive uh, innovative steps that you as an organization, as a team, as a responsible party take in order to make sure that your policy frameworks and everything that you, all the tools that you've developed, everything that you've done in preparation for this proverbial game gets implemented correctly. So essentially if you take all of these metaphors and the, the analogies that I've used and you apply that to a poppy compliance effort an undertaking, not a project, uh, because a project would insinuate, or using the term project would insinuate that uh, there would be a definitive start and a definitive end. In uh, this particular field, there, there will not be a particular end to uh, your compliance effort. It's going to be an ongoing thing, and unfortunately the reality is that it is everybody's job. So what we want to do today is you know, taking that context that I've just sketched for you, hopefully you, you followed and you, and you understand, um, you know, what I was trying to, to illustrate, um, but uh, we are going to take that context and we are going to be applying it to, to, to poppy compliance and what you as, as a responsible party ultimately need to do. So before we can deal with what you need to do, you need to understand where you are. You need to appreciate where you are. So let's take a step back quickly and just have a look at the status of, of, of the Poppy Act at the moment. Essentially, we are now in the so-called grace period or window period, which has been ushered in by section 114 of the Act, which has afforded all responsible parties a period of one year 
within which to comply, starting on the 1st of July 2020 um, and ending now on the 30th of June 2021. Now, one of the very important things that uh, a responsible party needs to do between now and the 30th of June 2021 is you need to make someone responsible for uh, taking the necessary steps to firstly establish uh, your compliance and then to maintain it. And that individual is the so-called information officer, the quarterback that I was referring to, to earlier. So every private and public body in South Africa uh, actually by default has got an information officer which is defined in terms of the act as the head of that particular private body or public body. And ultimately that individual now is charged with the responsibilities of the information officer. Those responsibilities are set forth in section 55 and regulation 4 of the act and that res responsible party um, needs to equip and empower that information officer essentially to, to establish a compliance framework, then implement it and then maintain it. And that requires resources. It also, as I said previously, is not necessarily a one-size-fits-all type scenario. Um, it's going to be different uh, depending on who you are, what type of, of business you're in, what type of, of industry and sector you operate within. It is also going to depend on how you operate as a business. So the logical point of departure for, for, for an information officer is to first establish what the Act requires of them and to then take the necessary steps uh, to, to, to comply with, with the Act. Now we've got the information officer, the quarterback, uh, who is in, in, in fact uh, takes on that role by default. That individual, the head of a private or a public body, often does not necessarily have the uh, capacity uh, or the resources immediately available at their disposal to be able to, to execute these responsibilities. So an information officer is then required to appoint a deputy or more than one deputy information officer within the organisation. Someone or individuals who can be that information officer's hands and feet effectively and execute the responsibilities of the information officer and ensure that the organisation takes the right steps at the right time and to do so effectively as well. Now, at some stage um, between now and the 30, 30th of June, every single responsible party is going to need to appoint those individuals and in instances where the authority or, or the responsibilities of, of, of the information officer need to be delegated to someone else, they need to give effect to that delegation and those appointments. And then the responsible party is required to register the information officer and deputy information officer uh, or officers with the information regulator. Essentially now we sit in a situation where uh, the act uh, or the, the window period is going to uh, come to an end uh, or expire on the 30th of June 2021 and what now? What do you as a responsible party need to do? What do you as an information officer need to do? Now the answer to that lies in the provisions of section 55 of POPI as well as regulation 4. Regulation 4 coming into effect on the 31st of May 2021. So now essentially when Regulation 4 becomes effective uh, on the 31st of May, uh, the information officer needs to start uh, executing their responsibilities if they have not done so already. Now ultimately what needs to happen is that you as an information officer need to establish a so-called compliance framework. You need to ensure that um, you establish or foster an environment uh, within which compliance is going to be possible, um, that you give effect to certain um, uh, stakeholder engagements that are going to create awareness and that are going to uh, inform the rest of your organisation and third parties with whom you engage what it is you as a responsible party are doing about 
poppy compliance. And then ultimately, uh, you know, you need to make sure that you are complying not only with poppy, but with the provisions of the Promotion of Access to Information Act as well. So I'm not going to get into, into each one of these conditions for lawful processing. What I would rather want to focus on is your compliance framework. What does that mean? What do these responsibilities of an information officer essentially entail uh, in, in, in simple terms or simpler terms? And also, how does that now tie back to the Direct Marketing Association's value offering um, and our value offering as, as Weaven Online as an alternative legal services provider? And also, what we need to do is we need to make sure that you are understanding and appreciate what the next steps are that you, that you would need to take in, in a logical, systematic uh, fashion. So ultimately, um, what would a resilient, uh, responsive, uh, innovative compliance uh, program uh, look like? And what we've wanted to do is to break it down for you into five steps. Ultimately, those, those key steps uh, could be broken down further into various subcomponents, depending on the size of your organization, depending on the scope and the type of personal information that you process, the, the purposes for, for, for why you process uh, that personal information. There's a host of other reasons as well. But ultimately, let's try and keep it simple. So what, what would a, a resilient, innovative compliance uh, program entail? What we believe is that the first step is to ensure that the information officer and the responsible party as a whole, being every single one of your team members, if we revert back to that football analogy that I used, understands and appreciates how this act and how this legislative scheme and framework is going to have an impact on them, especially on their day-to-day -day operations. Having a compliance framework is one thing, but implementing it is another. And we need to make sure that you appreciate and understand that your compliance framework and your policy framework needs to be converted into effective compliant business processes as well. So the first step is to understand how you process information, how you operate personal information, how you operate, what purposes you process that personal information for, and then also you need to appreciate um, whether there is a um, specific uh, legislative uh, scheme that is applicable to you outside of the poppy framework uh, or outside of poppy itself. So ultimately how you do that in our view is you implement and execute an impact assessment uh, so that you can understand and identify where your risks may lie. So that you can appreciate how the provisions of the Act relate back to your actual business processes. Then once you've identified these risks, step two, uh, you need to effectively uh, bundle those risks or group them, uh, articulate clearly what they are because ultimately you are going to need to address those risks. You are going to need to take steps, implement measures uh, to address those risks effectively to make sure that you are also foreseeing further future potential risks as well. The third step is in our view to really initiate a comprehensive awareness and um, uh, process of, of, of awareness and, and internal education. Ultimately, you as a responsible uh, party uh, need to ensure that your organisation understands and appreciates the effect and the impact that this legislative scheme is going to have on you. And you need to also ensure that your information officer is executing their responsibilities, uh, which is, amongst others, training and awareness, internal awareness. Uh, this is a very useful tool to also foster a culture and an environment within which your organization appreciates and understands what is expected of them and also assists the information officer and deputy information officer or officers to execute their responsibilities. Then this, the fourth step, once you've now identified your risks and you appreciate um, that you 
need to take certain steps and you've identified what those steps are, you need to effectively develop your compliance framework. And as I said previously, there isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all uh, compliance framework that could be applied to every single organisation in the same way. So just to refer back to the football analogy, you've got a set of plays um, and you are now executing those plays. Those plays being your uh, various policy documents, contractual documents, uh, adjusted or, or amended uh, onboarding processes, uh, etc. so that you can make sure that you comply with the notice requirements in terms of the Act. Ultimately, if those plays are not working, uh, because what works today might not work tomorrow, you need to change your approach. And then step five, once your compliance framework has been implemented, uh, well developed uh, and implemented, it needs to be maintained. So again, during the course of this, this game of poppy compliance, so to speak, uh, referring back to the football analogy, you need to change your approach. You need to stay um, on your toes. You need to make sure that you are not caught off guard. And in order to do so, you need to make sure that your compliance framework um, is, is, is maintained, that it stays intact, that it is continuously aligned back to your business processes and vice versa, and that you are taking proactive steps to identify foreseeable risks, deal with them, and then effectively remain compliant with, with, with the Act on an ongoing basis. So ultimately your compliance framework is not uh, limited to one particular outcome, uh, legal or otherwise. It's essentially the collective of steps, processes, protocols, policy frameworks uh, that you have implemented and deployed to ensure that your organisation uh, establishes a, an environment of compliance and remains compliant uh, in, in the long term. Now ultimately where does the Direct Marketing Association come in? Where does Weave and Online come in? We understand and we appreciate that this particular act is not easy to, to implement. Uh, implementation is incredibly important. Having the tools and not using them, you know, having the ball in the quarterback's hands and it not ending up in the right hands at the end of the day, in the end zone, um, you know, those, those policy frameworks, those tools, uh, your, your internal training uh, campaigns and programs, whatever those particular tools are, need to be implemented. Um, the, the, the process of implementing the Act is daunting, it is challenging and it is going to pose significant challenges for responsible parties on various levels. But ultimately what the DMA and uh, Weavend Online aims to do uh, through amongst other things uh, deploying the Direct Marketing Association's uh, compliance portal, uh, the DPCP, the Data Protection Compliance Program, uh, is to effectively give its member base the tools or access to the tools that they need in order to implement them in their day-to-day -day operations and within their organisations. If you were part of the Direct Marketing Association's roadshow last year, the digital roadshow that was, that was um, undertaken last year, you would have uh, heard uh, the DMA's plans to, to deploy the uh, Direct uh, Marketing Association's Data Protection Compliance Program. Effectively, the purpose of that uh, program is to give its members the tools uh, and access to the tools that they need in order to, um, to, to implement those tools and establish their compliance frameworks and, and, and execute them. So in keeping again with the theme of this year's uh, Insights Conference, uh, Resilience and Re-Innovation, uh, since last year's uh, Digital Roadshow, a lot has changed. So what we have done in collaboration with the Direct Marketing Association is we've taken a step back and we've reinvented that DPCP to make sure that when it gets relaunched in due course uh, it is going to be fit 
for the purposes that you require it as DMA members, that it is going to give you access to, to the relevant topical tools uh, that it is intended uh, for, or the purpose that it was intended for, is to give access to, to those tools uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and given the, you know, the change in, in, in the legislative framework as well, now and on an ongoing basis, uh, the DMA uh, is committed alongside us to make sure that that DPCP constantly evolves as well um, and, and remains agile. Um, so you are going to be seeing very soon the relaunch of, of the DMA's DPCP um, and we are going to make sure that you guys get access to the tools that you need. Ultimately, we cannot fulfill the role of your information officer and be your quarterback, but what we can do is help you develop the plays that you need in order to get your organization into the end zone and make sure that you do so in the right way and stay on the right side of this uh, tremendously uh, game-changing piece of, of, of legislation. So ultimately that is our purpose. Uh, I think uh, what I would like to also just mention is you know the benefits of this particular approach as well uh, that we've just gone through and the benefits of uh, a unique offering such as the Direct Marketing Association's DPCP uh, is that it enables responsible parties to address their interlinked legal and technical risks. So the legal uh, aspects are not, or let me rather say, taking care of the legal aspects uh, pertaining to, to your compliance journey and your compliance program is not enough. You need to make sure that your policy frameworks are, are effectively implemented, that responsibility is assigned to particular individuals uh, who can execute and make sure that those policies are adhered to. Um, and ultimately, those steps or those business processes are not always legal steps. Those are business processes, those are day-to-day -day operations that responsible parties uh, need to, to, to uh, undertake. And ultimately, what we need to do is we need to equip you with tools that, that are, are sensitive to that and that appreciate that. That you are in a position to assess and to map your legal to your technical risks and vice versa. And Ultimately, a compliance effort, as I previously mentioned, is an ongoing effort. It is not going to be a um, sort of uh, end zone scenario, proverbially speaking. Uh, there is not a definitive line here uh, for compliance. It's going to be a wrestle. It's going to be a battle constantly between what the legislation requires from a responsible party and actual business processes, uh, what those business processes need to look like in order to adapt to the legislative uh, requirements that are imposed upon responsible parties. So our approach takes that into consideration. Our approach is sensitive to that. We appreciate that you cannot comply yourself out of business either and ultimately we need to make sure that you, and that's why I like to to rather refer to it as navigate this piece of legislation, uh, uh, you know, to a point of compliance uh, as opposed to, to simply say that you, know, you need to, to comply and, and at some definitive point you will be compliant. That is factually not true. And you know, what we are here to do is to support you. So along with the DMA, uh, we are here to, to assist you in interpreting this ever-changing and evolving piece of legislation. Uh, we are going to see the introduction of industry codes, we are going to see the development of industry specific regulations, codes of conduct uh, and so on and so forth and we need to make sure that you stay up to date. We need to make sure that you are equipped with the necessary tools and, 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 and a, an evolving and adapting and an agile playbook on an ongoing basis. So with that said, I'd like to thank you. It's challenging to, to deal with, with you know, Poppy in, in a nutshell um, because it is a very uh, broad uh, and far-reaching uh, piece of legislation that deals with um, legal concepts uh, that, that are, are, are challenging not only to interpret but specifically to apply. 
but I would like to leave you with uh, you know, a sense of, of, of encouragement that uh, we are here to support you, we are here to assist you, um, and we are not going anywhere. Ultimately, this is a journey. Uh, this road to compliance is, is, is a difficult journey um, and we need to make sure that you are aware of that, that you are prepared for that and that you also know what you need to do on an ongoing basis. So I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for your time. I uh, sincerely appreciate again the, DMA, uh, the DMA's um, extension of, 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 of the invitation to us to be a part of this, this event. We do appreciate it. Ultimately, we are also learning. Um, our approach today is not what our approach was six months or a year ago. And uh, we can only make a commitment to you uh, that we are going to continue learning and we are going to stay at the forefront of what data protection legislation in South Africa is, is going to require of you so that you stay ahead of the game and ultimately get yourself in, 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 into the end zone. So thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Take care. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole and I head up the social and digital media team at Penguin and more recently the winner of the Asaga Awards Young Direct Marketer of the Year. I've been asked to talk a little bit about my experience and my tips and trends for 2021. Um, and I think something that 2020 reminded us all of is how drastically things can change. And I don't just mean change in the form of a pandemic, but in the form of algorithms, all the changes Facebook keeps making that nobody wants. And the fact that all we want is an edit button and Twitter still won't give us that means that some things won't change. With these changes, we keep looking at the data, searching for answers, how to stay on top of trends and at the top of our game in terms of our industry. And I have no doubt that all of you have most likely already done that and found those, those trends and that information um, for your brands and your clients. So I'm not gonna talk about that today. What I do want to talk about is the one thing that remains constant. We always talk about B2B and B2C and sometimes forget um, about H to H human to human connections and making sure that we remember that the people at the end of our marketing campaigns are just living, breathing human beings like us. So my top tips and trends for this year will not be that video is your top performing content piece or insert some other statistic here. Um, it will be to be human and to be genuine and relevant. Make sure that you're hiring diverse teams. The online space is a melting pot of cultures, race, and different lived experiences. And in order to navigate that as smoothly as possible in these times, um, having different voices that allow you to understand um, different perspectives and kind of help you navigate the social landscape from an understanding that you may not have. This will help you to avoid becoming disconnected and tone deaf. My next tip would be to listen we can never be 100% right or 100% perfect all the time, but listening and understanding what our audience is telling us, what they want to see, what they want to hear, and what they need us to do is your best way of making sure that your audiences are happy and your customers are happy. And then I think the most important one is one that's come up countless times before, and that is to tell stories, really relevant ones ones that make sense for you and your brand and for your audience. Um, don't pretend to be something that you're not. People can see that from a mile away and just tell stories that are really relevant to your brand and that highlight your core values and get the message across without feeling disingenuous. To end this off, I think I'll tell a story. Um, one of my favorite TED Talks ever was by Alexis Ohanian, the co-founder of Reddit. And he talks about how Greenpeace kind of did this campaign around um, a whaling expedition in Japan and they wanted to save the humpback whales and in order to kind of personalize this and get people um, a little bit more involved and invested they put a track on a humpback whale and they wanted to name him so naturally in, in true internet fashion they started an online poll they had suggested and put out some really thoughtful beautiful names and with those, additionally, they had Mr. Splashy Pants. Of course, Reddit users picked this up and within hours, the Mr. Splashy Pants was winning by a landslide. This carried on for weeks 
with Greenpeace kind of hoping that it would die down and another name would win it out and eventually they realized that it wasn't and Reddit wasn't going to give up um, on the fight. So um, something that they kind of had to learn and had to deal with was leaning into it and understanding that you don't always control the narrative, um, especially in the online space. So what they did was they leaned into it. They started selling Mr. Splashy Plants merch. He had an Instagram page. They started doing e-cards. And I think it just teaches us a lesson in terms of leaning into the chaos and understanding that we don't always control the conversation, but we know how and we control how we react to it though. Embrace the loss of control and lean into it. That's the only way that you'll succeed on social. I really hope that any of this resonated with you or helps you in your strategies for the upcoming year or makes you look at things a little bit differently for your upcoming plans. Um, and yeah, I really hope that this helped and you enjoyed it. Good day everyone, my name is Kino Johnson. I head up the direct and digital distribution team in MFC for Old Mutual South Africa. Thank you, Damasa, for affording us the opportunity to share our experience and our views on COVID-19 with everyone. What an equally exciting and challenging year 2020 has been for us at the Mass Foundation Cluster direct and digital distribution team. Similarly to the previous SARS outbreaks, to the everyday South African, the closest we would get to experiencing this COVID-19 would be via a news update. That's the closest we anticipated it to be. Little did we know this actually became a global pandemic that affected all of us in South Africa. For South Africa and for the rest of the African continent, this soon became one of the most complex socio-economic problems for us to deal with. Bringing it closer to our operations, we initially thought that this wouldn't impact us or our 450 staff members that we have. Before the hard lockdown, we already instituted a staff rotation for all our staff to make sure that we are able to mitigate most of the risk. Our operation is based at a fixed site and mobile connectivity has never been something that we previously explored. From a technology viewpoint, we had to explore the option of mobile connectivity, but had many challenges due to our technology stack that we were using. I assembled a small team to test the connectivity and our ability to be able to connect from home. And after a few iterations, we were able to crack the work from home solution. When the initial 21 days lockdown came into effect, we only had 21 laptops that we could use. And of those 21 laptops, we only had 20 people operational. After hard lockdown, we managed to secure more laptops. But as you can imagine, a lot of our suppliers were under immense pressure and stock was running low. While we were rolling out laptops in our business, we were also bringing some of our staff back to Mutual Park. We eventually managed to roll out 200 plus laptops and also bring 200 staff to fixed locations, some being based at Mutual Park and some of them being based at other locations. For those working at fixed locations, we had to ensure that we had the right COVID-19 protocols in place. As best as we tried to mitigate the risk, unfortunately, we still had a positive case. The result of the one positive case had us testing 270 people of the 270 people, we had to then determine who of them needed to go into self-isolation and who of them needed to go into self-quarantine. Along with the great support from our medical support team, we were able to effectively manage this over that period. As the lockdown levels changed for the better and then at the start of 2021 for the worst, we had to constantly manage our work from home and work from fixed location staff and manage the fluctuating of these staff numbers at very short notice. In our broader distribution team, we've developed remote selling for our face-to-face -face sales team through digital enablement. Holding true to the themes, resilience. Most of the resilience is attributed to our people. Being able to tackle very difficult business issues for us while at the same time managing their own personal experience of the pandemic. This is true of our sales force as well as our business support structures and enablement structures not only helping us from an enablement point of view, but also assisting us in organizing ourselves better throughout the pandemic. Re-innovation. We've changed the way we operate in the distribution space. We not only had to manage connectivity issues, but we also had to manage non-conducive work environments. The pandemic has also delivered residual benefit for us in the form of greater customer digital adoption. 
which resulted in stronger digital sales performance, as well as greater use of our digital channels like USSD and WhatsApp. From an artificial intelligence viewpoint, the team has been working very hard to ensure that we extract value from this capability. We are driving personalization to ensure that we are having the right conversations at the right time with our customers. This is work in progress, but we do believe that we will see great value coming out of this in the very near future. From a customer servicing and support perspective, we've enhanced automation for email classification and routing in order to improve turnaround times and also to alleviate strain on our contact centers. We've taken on the task of automating our data extraction from freeform text, documents, and images, and in some cases can respond to customers without the need of agents' intervention. Looking at our old mutual digital platforms, the COVID-19 pandemic has allowed us to accelerate the delivery of our digital platforms. Our customers can now do a number of things digitally. They can easily submit funeral claims via the public web, USSD, or WhatsApp. They can also view and download tax certificates, view their or mutual insure products that they have, as well as changing banking details, addresses, and telephone numbers. More so, our customers can view their old mutual rewards points, as well as their tier status, and this can be done via secure web, WhatsApp, or the old mutual app. There are a lot more exciting things coming for our customers digitally. Our lessons from COVID-19. It has stretched our thinking beyond our current capabilities, and it has allowed us to reimagine our business for the better. While COVID-19 will still be around for some time, we aim to adapt, stabilize, and then continue along the lines of our growth ambitions. Creating greater awareness and implementing best practices has been one of our greatest successes during this pandemic. Getting closer to our customers and suppliers to understand their experiences has also assisted us with this transition. More broadly speaking, our mutual has stepped up and showed support for all our healthcare workers in South Africa by offering them free cover during the pandemic. Importantly, taking care of our staff is our priority. Ensuring that we have the right COVID-19 protocols in place as well as having compliance officers in our business and around our business throughout the day. We conduct two or three checks throughout the day to make sure that the temperatures are in order. And we also do questionnaires throughout the day to ensure that if anyone has any symptoms, we are able to pick it up and act on it immediately. All these obstacles we had to overcome as a business would not have been possible if we didn't have the right people in place. While we were overcoming these obstacles, we also had to demonstrate to our people that we acknowledge the personal experiences that they are going through as a result of this pandemic. While we are grateful for everyone that was tested positive and managed to make a full recovery, we acknowledge all of those not only in South Africa but also in Old Mutual that have passed. Collectively as Old Mutual, we were able to pull together from different business units and solve the challenges as they arose. I'd like to thank Demasa again for giving us the opportunity to share our experiences of COVID-19, our lessons learned, resilience that we've shown as a business, and also some re-innovation that we've had to go through during this process. Thank you very much again. We appreciate your time.